start again. Thank you. Uh, the President has uh, received the following letter from Senator McKim. The letter is, Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today the Australian Greens propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following uh, is a matter of urgency, that women in Australia deserve genuine progress on women's safety, health and economic security, including fully funded frontline women's safety services, superannuation on paid parental leave, investment in affordable housing to tackle the growing risk of homelessness amongst older women, raising the rate of income support and the minimum wage, making a full range of pre-productive health care accessible through the public health system, and making uh, universal and high-quality early education and childcare free and accessible across the country, all of which should be funded with the $254 billion in savings from scra scrapping the stage three tax cuts which mostly benefit rich men. Uh, from Senator McKim of Tasmania. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. The concurrence of the Senate and the clerks will set the clocks in line with the informal arrangements made by WHIPS. I call Senator Waters. Thank you so very much, um, Acting Deputy President. It's great to see a woman of colour in the chair on International Women's Day. Um, I move the matter of urgency uh, standing in my name today. It is International Women's Day, and women deserve genuine progress on safety, on health, on economic security, including fully funded frontline women's safety services, superannuation on a decent amount of paid parental leave, investment in affordable housing to tackle the growing risk of homelessness, which is rising amongst older women. Women deserve raising the rate of income support and the rate of the minimum wage, which is disproportionately earned by women. Women deserve making a full range of reproductive health care accessible through the public health system so that people can actually afford to access the reproductive health care they deserve. And women deserve making universal, high-quality early childhood education free and accessible no matter where you are in this country. Now, all of those amazing things that would improve the daily material lives of women could be funded. They could be funded if this government chose to ditch the stage three tax cuts initially proposed by Scott Morrison and now backed in by this Labor government. They could save $254 billion of public money and instead of giving it to the 40 per cent of rich white men, they could instead spend it on women and deliver those policy outcomes which will actually help people, will pull people out of poverty, will help us achieve safety and equality. So every day this government could choose to improve the lives of women, but today being International Women's Day, you'd think that on this day the Albanese government would commit to something real, a real tangible action on improving women's safety or on economic security or on equality. Instead, we've got a report card telling us what we already know. It's a good distillation of the data, but unfortunately there was no announcement today from the government saying what they would do to fix any of those hideous metrics about women being killed, about women being in poverty, about women being paid less than blokes. The list goes on and it's very sobering reading. But if this government still doesn't know what needs to be done to actually achieve gender equality, then it's time to start listening to the women of the country who have been very vocal about this and there's even an obvious way to pay for it. It beggars belief that Labor refuses to walk away from the stage three tax cuts. As I mentioned before, 40 per cent of those would go to men already in the top 10 per cent of earners, a group that certainly doesn't need any more help from the government. They're doing very nicely. The Status of Women report card says that women approaching retirement have 23.1 per cent less super than men of the same age. We know that paying superannuation on paid parental leave would go a long way towards closing that gap. But we haven't heard a commitment from this government on that yet. We also know that the fastest growing cohort of people at risk of homelessness are women, and it's not just women over the age of 55 as it was before COVID, it's now women over the age of 45. Yet this government's proposal to fix the housing crisis falls so far short of, what needed, of what's needed. It actually makes things worse by not keeping pace with people who need a roof over their head. Women make up more than 60 per cent of those relying on income support payments. Job seeker, student and parenting payments, they are struggling 
to make ends meet as the cost of living rises, but the government still will not raise the rate. The Status of Women report card notes that it takes an average of five years to receive a diagnosis of endometriosis, despite one in nine women suffering from it. This inequality in access to women's reproductive health care will persist without federal intervention. What's missing from the Status of Women report card is a real-time toll of women killed by violence to keep that issue at the front of decision makers' minds. What's also missing is data about unmet need. How many women are turned away from frontline services because those, those services simply don't have the resources that keep up with demand? The, service, the women's support and uh, women's safety sector have said time and time again they need a billion dollars to help everyone that seeks their help. They are turning women and children away because they do not have the resources to help them. The last budget fell short on that pledge, and I asked the minister earlier today in question time whether or not any movement could be seen on that, and I was given a promising response. We will hold you to account on that. The women of Australia are grateful for this compilation of data showing how unequal we are, but what we actually want is policy action to redress, uh, to redress that inequality, and those stage three tax cuts are the best way to fund women's safety, equality and economic security. Thank you. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, I stand today very proudly uh, as a member of the coalition team that in, when in government was absolutely committed to improving women's safety, economic security and health, health outcomes for Australian women. We absolutely know that family, domestic and sexual violence is a complete scourge on Australian society. And we in the coalition believe that this is a matter that needs to be tackled without any partisanship, because unless we do so, we can never hope to actually achieve that goal of striving towards a zero violence target, which I think is something that every single person in this chamber, in this government and hopefully in this country wants to strive for. So improving safety for women, uh, women and their children uh, is obviously something that, is, that comes with a price tag, and that's why, when we in government, we were very pleased to have allocated in the 2022-23 budget $1.3 billion to prove, improve outcomes through initiatives uh, in relation to women's safety. Um, and this brought the coalition government's commitment to women's safety um, over the period of the final two years and the first year of the, uh, the next action plans uh, to $2.5 billion to support the transition and implementation towards the next action plan. And having been the former Minister for Women's Safety, I was really proud to have been part of the development of the next action plan, uh, which we saw as a blueprint towards providing the kind of uh, commitments that all levels of government, all levels of society uh, would put towards driving that goal of towards zero. Because the reality is um, that our commitments have to span the life cycle of violence but also our commitments have to actually span every single person in Australia, because it is no use for governments to spend money, it is no use for us to stand here and make commitments unless we can convince every single Australian that violence against women and children, in fact any violence, is absolutely wrong. So to end gendered violence, we have to stop it from happening in the first place. And that's why measures that go towards organisations such as Our Watch, who intrinsically um, are designed and, and established to make sure that we have campaigns so that we can teach younger Australians about issues such as respect, stopping violence, calling violence out, making sure that their behaviours are respectful and making sure that we and they are investing in community-led initiatives to deal with violence at the front line. But we also have to realise that in the process of doing this we still have to respond at the other end to those women who are facing violence and their children daily. And that's why we were pleased to establish the escaping violence payment to provide women with up to $5,000 so that when they were escaping violence they had the financial assistance to be able to set up homes and start to establish a life free from violence. So we are very pleased to have been able to stand um, with Australian women in making sure that we were the first ones to put the largest ever commitment um, against ending violence against women and their children, and acknowledge that the new government has continued that investment uh, and that commitment towards zero um, for Australian women to live a life free of violence. 
But I'm also pleased to say that we also made a very significant commitment in women's health um, because we believe that the overall wellbeing of women can only be underpinned if they have access to um, affordable um, health care to meet their health care needs. Uh, and that was why we put significant funding towards maternal, sexual and reproductive health, but most particularly one area that we were very pleased to have worked uh, in a bipartisan way with the then opposition it was in relation to funding uh, for women who are affected by endometriosis. And I want to give a shout out to Nicole Flint, uh, a previous member in this place for the, for the Liberal Party, and to Gay Brotman, who was uh, a previous member in this place for the Labor Party, who together worked very, very hard to establish a platform and a plan um, for endometriosis uh, and to respond to endometriosis, which when in government we were pleased to put a $58 million commitment towards to make sure that we were dealing with earlier diagnosis, ensuring women had access to the kind of resources so that they could make informed decisions about their health, and so that doctors were provided with guidance around best treatment to help women who live with endometriosis. Um, I want to acknowledge that when we made that announcement of $58 million, the then opposition, now government, said that they would honour that commitment as well, and we were obviously delighted. I was also delighted earlier in this year to stand next to um, the Assistant Minister for Health and Aged Care when two of the initiatives that were contained in that $58 million um, were announced as um, being activated and ongoing. Um, obviously, we await um, to make sure that the remainder of the initiatives in that announcement are delivered by this government, but I hope we can continue in a bipartisan way for the sake of Australia's women. Thank you. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Look, I'm uh, really happy to be contributing to this debate today as well. It's a really important debate and a really important topic, and particularly today on International Women's Day. But I'm particularly happy to be able to contribute to this debate from the government benches as part of the Albanese Labor government. Now, we agree that women in Australia, of course, deserve genuine progress on their safety, on health and on economic security. But do you know how that happens? It happens from only the structural changes, the long-term systemic changes, which you can do from government. And if you need any evidence of this, you can see it in the past decade where no amount of protest or opposition was enough to stop Tony Abbott when he appointed himself as a Minister for Women in a cabinet with only one other woman. It wasn't enough to stop the Liberals trying to force those experiencing domestic violence to raid their superannuation accounts. It wasn't enough to stop the op now opposition, then government, leaving the Respect at Work report gathering dust on a shelf. And it wasn't enough to stop the plummet in staff numbers at the Office for Women. No opposition, as loud as it may have been, wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to stop us going from 23 to 50 for overall gender equality in the Gender Gap Index. That's what happened under the previous government. But you know how you change it? You know how you turn that around? You do it from within government, by forming government. Not from opposition, not from the noisy stuff on the sidelines. And being in government requires adult decision-making processes, decisions which require you to pay for things, cost them, prioritise them and deliver them. And we do deliver in the Labor Party. When we're in government, we deliver. Indeed, I would say we are the only party in this place who could stand here with any meaningful credibility and say we have delivered the real long-term systemic changes which have made a significant difference to gender equity and equality in Australia. And we've done this because we believe in gender equality, we fight for it, but also we are the embodiment of it. This is the first government in our nation's history which is majority female. And it shows. It shows in what we're doing, it shows in how we're acting, it shows in what we're prioritising. And this government, this Labor government, is not the first reforming Labor government on the question of gender equality. Actually, every government, every time we've held government, we've made significant strides to make this place, this country, a better, fairer, equal, more safe place for women. Whether it's the Whitlam government introducing no-fault divorce and their support for equal pay, or the Hawke and Keating governments with the Sex Discrimination Act, Rudd and Gillard governments introducing Commonwealth paid parental leave and the National Plan to Reduce Domestic and Family Violence. Every time we're in government, every time Labor is in government, we deliver for women. Not from the sidelines, but from these benches, by making the tough decisions, the difficult decisions that prioritise women's equality and equity. 
Our government, the Albanese government, will be no exception. We're one year in, but already we're embedding women's economic equality as a core economic imperative, making significant investments in early childhood education to boost productivity and women's ability to participate in the workforce, knowing that their children are well cared for, that they can afford to make that decision to go back to work. We're extending paid parental leave progressively up to six months, but importantly, we're also making it fairer so that more families can access paid parental leave, including single parent families. We're establishing the Women's Economic Equality Task Force to provide advice to government and commence work on a national strategy to achieve gender equality. We've supported a pay increase for aged care and low paid workers, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly who are women. We've led negotiations with the states and territories to finalise the national plan to end violence against women and children. And we've backed this up with funding. $1.7 billion to implement the plan, including $83 million for consent and respectful relationship education and $100 million for crisis and transitional housing options for women and children fleeing domestic and family violence. We've legislated paid family and domestic violence leave, a huge and proud moment in this parliament. And we're funding and legislating to fully implement all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report. In addition to this, when it comes to women's health, we've established a National Women's Advisory Council to tackle medical misogyny. You don't have to dig too deep into our healthcare system to see how it disadvantages women. But the truth is, if you want to make these changes, these big structural changes, you have to do it as a party of government. There's only one party in this place who's delivered for women on these big structural issues, made meaningful strides towards gender equality. It's Labor, Labor, Labor. Thank you. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. You may not know this, but five years ago, Tasmanian women needed to travel to Melbourne to access a surgical abortion. The last private surgical clinic in the state had shut down, and women had nowhere else to go. Women were generally spending over $1,500 to travel to another state to get access to the health care they needed, and some had to pay more. Access to state termination services were bad. In practice, it was really only available to the people who could afford it. Now women in Tasmania can access surgical abortions through the public hospital system. And I think that's a really great thing. We've come a long way in the last five years, but access to a surgical termination is just one obstacle that's been removed for women who want an abortion in Tasmania. There's still a whole field of hurdles left to go. I've been speaking to some Tassie women's health organisations and listening to the evidence presented to the Senate inquiry into universal access to reproductive health care. I've heard that in Tassie it's cheaper and easier to access surgical termination than to access chemical termination. You need a spare $350 or so to get a chemical termination, and you can get a rebate on this. In the end, you're out of pocket by about $150. But what if you don't have a spare $150 just lying around, let alone the $350 you need to pay up front before the rebate? Well, you go to the hospital because that's free. It's free for you but it costs the taxpayer around $3,000. You get a bed in the hospital, but that's a bed someone else can't get access to. Our system shouldn't be pushing people to access surgical terminations if there's less invasive, quicker and cheaper ways of doing things. We need better, cheaper access to chemical abortions. We need clinics in place that are serviced by public transport. They all need to be open at least five days a week. I'd like to hear from Tassie women and families about their experiences with access to termination services. I want to know what you need and what we can do to help you. Senator Polly. I'm proud to stand here today on International Women's Day as a member of the Albanese Labor government, the first ever majority <laughs> government in Australia's history the first ever women's majority government in Australia's history. Now, Australian Greens believe that women in Australia deserve genuine progress on women's safety, health and economic security, and I couldn't agree more. And the Albanese Labor government could not agree more. That's why we've passed 10 days of paid family and domestic violence leave appointed Ms Cronin as the first domestic family and sexual violence commissioner, delivered $1.3 billion 
in the October 2022 budget towards implementation of the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children in 2022-32, allocated $100 million for crisis and transitional housing options for older women at risk of homelessness and for women and children leaving family and domestic violence situations. We've invested in early childhood education and paid parental leave, supported a pay rise for our lowest paid workers and for aged care workers in particular that I've been fighting for for so long. We've supported those women, predominated by women in their workforce. We've established a National Women's Advisory Council to improve health outcomes for women and to tackle medical bias, committed to implementing all 55 recommendations from the Respect at Work report to ensure that our workplaces are environments that are free from harassment, assault and abuse. Australia is by no means perfect. Our globally standing on women's rights has dropped significantly, especially over the last 10 years in action and disregard by the previous government. But the work of the Albanese Labor government is righting these wrongs. We are working hard every day to ensure that women are safe and respected in the workplaces, in their homes and in our communities. I want to add that International Women's Day is a day to reflect on inspiring women within every community, and none more so in my home state of Tasmania. We can also reflect on accomplishments of women in our lives and where we are achieving change, and remember the journey we've taken personally. I remember campaigning for a girl's right at my high school to wear trousers instead of uniforms. Uh, of skirts during winter because it was so cold. I campaigned for girls' rights to study woodwork and metalwork in my high school. The campaign for gender equality continues as we try to end the gender pay gap, gap sorry, and ensure women and girls are afforded opportunities to succeed in whatever field or endeavours they choose to pursue in work and in life. And this week we spent a lot of time, particularly in question time, talking about the increase uh, superannuation changes that have been made for people that uh, have $3 million or more in their superannuation fund. Well, I remember as a young woman working in Melbourne in a short-term money market in the finance sector, and at that time you had to work for that company for 10 years before you might might be invited to join the superannuation scheme. So I thank Paul Keating, again, a Labor government that introduced superannuation, which gave uh, women like myself the opportunity to start earning some superannuation, because as we all know, there is a disadvantage for, for women when they leave the workforce to have their children and then when they come back in. And for people of my generation, for women of my generation, we just don't have the savings in superannuation that thankfully my daughters will have going forward. So there is still so much to be done. And I think instead of uh, you know, at times, people coming into this chamber and trying to make political uh, points. I urge, as I know others, including Senator Waters, uh, where we believe women should be working together, irrespective of where your political views are. The only way we're going to advance women and to give our daughters and granddaughters the future they deserve is if we work together, if we keep raising these issues to make people aware that women still don't have the same rights when it comes to earnings as what our male counterparts do. Thank you. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. One of the things that stands out to me each International Women's Day is how corporatised, white collar and lacking in class politics it's become. It's certainly a long way from its socialist origins. As BBC News was reporting today, the seeds of International Women's Day were planted in 1908 when 15,000 women marched through New York City demanding shorter working hours, better pay and the right to vote. The following year, the Socialist Party of America declared the first National Women's Day. The idea to make the, interna the day international came from Clara Zetkin, a communist activist and advocate for women's rights. 
Ms Setkin suggested the idea in 1910 at an international conference of working women in Copenhagen. There were 100 women there from 17 countries, and they agreed on her suggestion unanimously. Whilst many things have changed since 1910 for women, there is still much to be done. The fact of the matter is that women's economic security has a long way to go, and it's worse for women of colour, First Nations women, migrant women, trans women, and for those of us who live in regional Australia. The gender pay gap still exists, including within many feminised professions, such as midwifery and teaching. Despite women making up 99 per cent of the midwifery workforce, the gender pay gap in that profession still sits at 19 per cent. The government is forcing women to wait to have 26 weeks of paid parental leave, and just last week the government said they'd like to add super to paid parental leave, but the budget can't accommodate it. In my community of Gladstone, women are still driving over 100 kilometres to Rockhampton to give birth with the maternity unit still on bypass after 243 days. I reckon if men gave birth, this problem would have been sorted yesterday. And now women over 45 are the fastest growing group who are experiencing homelessness. It's the same story all over the country. There's always money for stage three tax cuts, which will overwhelmingly benefit rich blokes, but there's never enough for women's health or women's super or women's parental leave or women's salaries in feminised industries. We're sick to death of it. This morning on the radio, the Treasurer said that Labor's stage three tax cuts would go ahead, but the cost of living relief for people who are a paycheck away from homelessness or a meal away from starving would only be possible when inflation was tamed. Go down and, go down and tell a homeless woman that. Come up to Gladstone and tell the women that they'll have to drive over an hour on a potholed highway to give birth. Tell every woman in this country who is paid less than men that they'll have to wait. And meanwhile, you'll hand out your stage three tax cuts to rich blokes. It makes me sick. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. Thank you, Senator Hanson. I support helping women, but no doubt I'll be the only woman today speaking for the most oppressed and neglected minority in Australia, men. It's ironic that the women who bring men into the world are so ready to dismiss and abandon them to boost their orthodox feminist credentials. But in Australia, men are severely overrepresented in suicides, in prison, in homelessness and in unemployment. What has been done to close these enormous gaps? Nothing. In particular, Australian men are severely disadvantaged in the family law system and labourers make it worse by removing shared parenting. Men deserve a much as much access to the children as women do. Men deserve acknowledgement as representing a quarter of domestic violence victims. Men deserve help with their health issues. Men deserve much more recognition by this government and this parliament. How about we start with a minister for men? Thank you, Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Happy International Women's Day to all my sisters uh, here and beyond the chamber. Um, today, uh, the government has given us what women have always craved for International Women's Day, a report card. We don't need another report card. I have a library of them, like every other gender equality advocate in the country. We could paper the walls of this place with the reports, report cards we have on gender equity. I'm sure uh, that many of people on, across this chamber could uh, contribute reports. We've seen so many. If report cards won the day on gender equity, we'd be in a paradise. We don't need report cards. We need action. We're told we have to wait. Well, I'm waiting for the day when we hear that defence has to wait for some things they really, really want. They want $170 billion to buy some submarines. Um, we could do with a bit of that going to women. So instead of a report card, I want to suggest a few things the government could do that are action. First of all, put super into paid parental leave. It won't close the gender super gap. It would narrow it by about 10 percentage points in my calculation, but it's an insult not to be doing it already. It's cost, it'll cost about 2.5 per cent of a Virginia-class Virginia submarine, probably the periscope. Secondly, 20 weeks paid parental leave now, not in 2026, still only half the international standard. So while um, uh, we, while you're at it, we should do with, get a map going for 52 weeks as soon as possible, much less than a submarine would cost. 
Make childcare free, not just cheaper, but make it free. Fourth, give an immediate wage supplement to working carers who are leaving jobs that they love in droves across the aged care system, across childcare and disability. We women want more than a report card. We deserve better. We know our pay is 84 per cent of men's. We know we do more unpaid work than men. It's time to give us action and share out the public dollars that are there to support what we really need now. Thank you. Uh, the time for discussion has expired. I'm now going to put the question uh, that the uh, matter of importance, uh, sorry, the urgency motion on women's safety, health and economic security um, moved by Senator Waters is agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. And the bells for four minutes. You don't want to divide? Okay. Cancelling the division. The, the ayes have it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to Mad Sorry, uh, Senator Rusty. Uh, Madam Deputy um, President, um, I seek leave to move a motion in relation to no, setting up. I, I give notice. <laughs> I seek leave to give notice. <laughs> is Liz uh, granted? I don't think we'll be starting with John O seeks leave advice. to give notice. Um, and he I, didn't have eight years as deputy. Is Liz I, I seek, seek leave to give notice in relation to the general business motion for tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so I give notice on the next sitting day I shall move uh, that the Senate notes the Albanese government's broken promises to deliver cheaper power prices, cheaper mortgages, to not make any changes to super as well as broken promises on medicines, country doctors, Medicare and mental health. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rustin. <laughs> Moving on to the matter of importance, a uh, proposal from Senator Hughes has been received under Standing Order 75 as follows. Uh, dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The government's failure to provide certainty about who and what will be taxed under Labor's broken promises for new super taxes and new franking credit taxes, including our hard-working farmers who are at risk of paying thousands more in, in tax simply because of paper fluctuations in commercial property prices. Uh, is the proposal supported? Thank you. With the concurrence of... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm from the other side. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will now set the clocks in lines with the informal arrangements made by whips. And I call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Matt, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's all going well for everyone today. Isn't it? It's all running very, very smoothly. Uh, what's not going so smoothly, though, is the superannuation plans of so many Australians. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Day after day, we're now seeing broken promise after broken promise, pants on fire as they've once again deceived the Australian electorate into what they said they would do before the election and to what they are doing now. This government seems to think that it can somehow just push through lovely sounding ideas, no substance, no detail, how much it will cost, how it will actually work and who it will impact, but yet think that everyday Australians are just not going to notice. But the Australian people are smarter than this and they see through this plan. But what we do know about those opposite when they don't have a plan, when they can't stop spending, when they run out of money, they're going to come after yours. The Treasurer and the Prime Minister have been missing in action in addressing our cost of living crisis that is impacting every single Australian. And every decision they do make just makes a bad situation worse. They do enjoy appearing in front of the cameras with a sombre look on their faces as if to say they feel the pain of Australians that are doing it tough out there. But is there a solution? No. No, there's not. 
Let's just pray to God that the RBA governor's 10th consecutive rate does the trick. On a wing and a prayer, this Labor government is hopeful that the RBA will stop raising interest rates on their watch. Let's blame the war in Ukraine and let's blame the previous government for what's occurring. No responsibility taken and no transparency and no maintenance of maintaining their promises. As most Australians would know, they have a typical mortgage of over, uh, around $750,000. They're now paying $1,700 more a month. That's an extra $20,000 per year. That is an awful lot of money for a lot of families who are now struggling to make end meet. And what we do know as well is that not only is this impact causing great financial stress, and the stress levels are increasing to such a level that Lifeline is increasing significant more activity and requirement for its services. There is actually data from Suicide Prevention Australia that shows that 46 per cent of Australians have reported feeling increased pressure as the cost of living rises to, continues to rise. This is up 5 per cent from last year. The decisions of this government have real impacts on real families and real people's lives. They're not doing enough to make the Reserves Bank easier. They're doing nothing to look after inflation. And what we do know is now, with an increase to taxes on truckies, they're going to further put pressure on inflation as the cost of absolutely everything in our country that's produced on a farm, every single thing that's manufactured in this country that utilises trucking services to get to the consumer, all of those prices are set to increase, adding inflationary pressure. Perhaps a few of those opposites should have attended the Parliamentary Friends of Trucking event that was held earlier this week, particularly around cold chain supply, uh, where Senator Stirl, their great colleague, long history in the trucking industry, spoke of the heroes that exist in the trucking industry. Yet his colleagues cannot more quickly than they can do, they can help it to make those truckies' lives difficult with increased taxes, with looking to make their road user charges increase. All of this they did not say before the last election. But I guess for those in the bush, it's not just looking at the logistical issues, it's just, just the trucking issues, it's not just the impact that these uh, broken promises will have on those farming families. But I think one of the greatest concerns is the change to this superannuation. Uh, $3 million threshold that they claimed was 0.5 per cent, that we now know is 10 per cent, is the unrealised asset at a family farm. Never before have we seen an Australian government try and implement a tax on an unrealised asset, and yet when asked simply, when asked directly how many Australian families, how many self-managed super funds are going to be impacted, it's embarrassingly silent. The prevarication of a modest change. Well, I can tell you it's not a modest change if you get a paper value increase on the family farm as part of your self managed super fund, and all of a sudden you've got a tax bill and have to sell the lifeblood and the history of your family to pay for this government's failure. Thank you. I call Senator uh, S. Just on a quick procedural matter, um, uh, there, there was some confusion at the end of that division. Uh, I didn't hear. I describe it as a change of shift issue um, with, uh, with the uh, urgency that we just dealt with. Um, the Greens urgency? The Greens urgency. Yeah. Um, I, want to, I did not hear you rule on whether it was uh, ruled for the eyes or for the nose. I'd like at the very least for it to be recorded that Labor senators voted against the proposition and the question of whether we need to divide. I'd propose not to interrupt the, the matter that's been dealt with at the moment, but may need to be dealt with at the conclusion of the current debate. Yes, that's right. So there's a there, there, there is that question, but that may lead to a subsequent decision by um, my friends in the Greens Party that that they would then seek for it to go to a division, which is fine. Um, but I'd ask that that be dealt with at the conclusion of this debate. Uh, and um, apologies for the confusion. Thank you for clearing that up, Senator Ayres. So maybe if I, sorry, Senator O'Sullivan. We'll deal with it uh, at the conclusion. But uh, in case we don't, I'll just state that the uh, opposition also voted no. Okay. So maybe I'll put the question again, or would you like it dealt at the end? We're in the middle of the 
coalition's MPI. I'm right. very happy for them to proceed with that. I don't want to interrupt that. But also be the uh, colleague to lead the change without being told what the situation was. We'll deal with that at the end. So yes, we'll continue with the MPI. Thank you for uh, clarifying that, you. Senator Ayres. Uh, I now call Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, you know, the Liberals used to pretend they were, they were standing up for working people. Now we know they're only standing up for the 0.5 per cent. And not about the fact that the 0.5 per cent are paying appropriate amount of tax for the fact that they should be turning around in superannuation and paying an amount of tax which is appropriate to the amount of money they had. Because have because we all know that superannuation, we all know, the country knows it, the people opposite me don't know it. Superannuation was built on the fact, and the purpose was to make sure that we have money set aside for every Australian to be able to retire in a good and faithful way. And because what because what it is is because we have the Liberals, you know, they have abandoned Howard's battlers. They're now just about Dutton's billionaires. That's what they're about, because we've initiated a, a, a response to the fact that this trillion dollars worth of debt has been placed onto this country because of the excessive and inappropriate nature of how these people recklessly spent without investing on improving productivity in this country. Because not only we saw wages go down, we saw productivity go down because they flopped it. They failed. And of course, we as a country are paying the consequences. So what we're saying to those many billionaires is that, yes, there's still a tax benefit, but the tax benefit has changed. Because someone we have to weigh to turn around and look at this minor change to make sure that we have the opportunity to start paying down their debt. Their debt. And the people that are most capable of paying that down are the ones that are still getting a tax benefit, but not the tax benefit that they are receiving for a scheme that they have been rorting against the intent of what the scheme was for. Because the scheme was always for to make sure that there was a fair and reasonable retirement scheme. So what they have managed to do and what we have been saying is that those people that are on the 0.5 per cent that have actually turned around and minimised their tax, not illegally, legally, but against the spirit of what that legislation was and because of the nature of what the, the, those opposite have done with a trillion dollars debt, that they should turn around and make a contribution, because they still have an opportunity after the election, on, in, between now and the election, about how they deal with those changes of circumstances. But I really want to point out one of the billionaires that these people are supporting across the way. Billionaire property magnate John Gandall has slammed the federal government's proposed change—and I'm reading from an article from the Sydney Morning Herald um, by Ms. Uh, Ms. Samble on the 2nd of March. Gandall made the criticism on Wednesday by the, of, at the launch of a $70 million entertainment precinct at the huge Chadston shopping centre in Melbourne, south east, that the co-owns with Vicinity Centre's property group. Now, the mall magnate, it goes on to say, was frustrated by the government's decision to double the tax on earnings on superannuation balances over three million and said it would inevitably affect more than just the country's top earners. He says a tax high hike on the top earners of the country who have worked hard in this country will always come down on the middle class. Now, this is John Gandall, right? John Gandall. Now, for those that don't recall the history of some of the history of super, the people opposite stopped the lowest paid people in this country, people that were getting the minimum superannuation on International Women's Day, particularly women who are disadvantaged under superannuation, from getting the superannuation guarantee increased. In actual fact, from 2014 to 2020, from the per capita inquiry into the super consequences of their delay, it cost the average worker on fifty odd thousand dollars a year, four thousand three hundred dollars, nine per cent of their entire income for a year was stolen by these people across here, and they're worrying about Mr. Chandle. Of course, he is worried about the middle class, because he obviously. Oh, no, second thoughts. I've looked and I've looked. No, he never spoke up about the fact that the minimum 
increase for superannuation, the superannuation guarantee, had to be fixed for the middle class. Because what he's doing, he's conflating his own self-interest because that $4,300 that would have been going into the dozens and hundreds and thousands of people that work in companies that he either directly employs or employs through his developments would have got that money. So he pocketed that money and guess where he put it? I guess he put it into his superannuation scheme. He took it out of theirs and put it in his. That's what he did. Thank Dutton's you, billionaires Senator won out. Your time has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, <laughs> here we go again for the third day out of the three sitting days this week. We're getting uh, a slightly different version of the, the pity the multimillionaires routine that uh, the Liberal National Party loves so much to run. Um, it's really interesting that they would include um, farmers in, uh, in their wording on this motion. I talk to a lot of farmers. And you know the number one thing, almost universally, the very first thing farmers bring up with me is climate change. That's what they bring up with me. What do we hear about the Liberals on climate change? How to oppose real climate action. That's what we hear from the Liberals. We've just had 10 successive rate rises um, by the RBA, absolutely smashing anyone, including farmers, who is carrying debt. Uh, what do we hear from Mr Dutton about that? Absolutely nothing. And yet here we go when the only people who are going to be affected by the government's very modest fiddling at the margins proposal on superannuation tax concessions are the multimillionaires, and suddenly, oh, well, what about uh, the hard-working farmers? Well, undoubtedly, many farmers do work hard, but I want to make the point that just because somebody is a hard-working farmer, it doesn't mean they're not rich, and it doesn't mean, if they are rich, that they shouldn't be paying their fair share of tax. Because if farmers are going to be impacted by the changes that Labor is proposing to the superannuation tax concessions, then by definition they are at the wealthy end of the spectrum. So this is just another example of the LNP uh, using farmers to run their pity the multimillionaires argument. But of course this is more than just a pity the multimillionaires argument we're hearing today. By calling on Labor not to break election promises, that is, of course, the way that the Liberals are defending their much-loved stage three tax cuts for the top end, defending a quarter of a trillion dollars worth of tax cuts that the top 20 per cent of earners get 80 per cent of the benefit of. And on International Women's Day, defending a quarter of a trillion dollars worth of tax cuts where men get twice the benefit of women. I mean, happy International Women's Day, everyone on the LNP side of the chamber, coming in here and defending the stage three tax cuts where women will only get half the benefit that men do. Shame on you all. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Well, we've just heard it. We've just heard it. The Labor Greens Alliance never met a tax they didn't like. We've just heard it from Senator McKim claiming to know the views of farmers. Well, I do talk to farmers, Senator McKim. I talk to farmers every day. And I have talked to a number of farmers on this superannuation issue. And I can tell you right now, Senator McKim, they are concerned about these issues. They are concerned about these issues. You laugh. Senator Ayres, but farmers are concerned about these issues, and I'll, I'll explain to you why, because I don't think you understand, and I don't think this government understands, and I certainly know the Greens don't understand. Farmers uh, are not necessarily cash, cash rich. Their asset significantly, they have significant assets at various times, but they are not cash rich. One of the legitimate ways they prepare for their retirement is to put farming property into super funds. And this is not just true of farmers, this is true of small business owners, particularly in regional areas where they will put their premises into their super fund. It is true of professionals, not just in not just in not just in you're laughing at the farmers again, Senator Ayres. They don't have 
it's professionals, not just in regional Order. Australia, not just in regional Australia, but in, in, in our South capital cities, where professionals put their offices into their super funds, and then the farmer will retire. And their super fund may not be generating large amounts of cash. In fact, it may only be generating enough cash to pay a pension. So what happens then when they get this tax bill from the government? What happens then when they get this tax bill? And I want all Australians to understand out there that $3 million land holding in a super fund is not a massive amount. A, a, a property that was purchased, a property that was purchased say in the 1980s and placed into a super fund could easily have appreciated could easily have appreciated so you've got a super fund which has got a large physical asset in it senator mckim but it's not generating that much cash it's only generating enough cash for the for the person involved to take out their pension so what do then they have to do when they get the tax bill from the government what do they have to do they have to either pay the tax out of their own pocket or they have to sell assets. That is the reality of what the government is proposing here today. And this doesn't just affect farmers, this affects small business owners who have their, their uh, uh, property assets, uh, possibly their business, in their uh, super fund. Again, these are people who don't necessarily take an income directly. They don't necessarily have a lot of cash to put in super. They have an asset, a physical asset in super. This is the first time that the appreciation in value of that physical asset is being taxed before the asset is realised. Before the sale of an asset is turned into cash, it is being taxed. And that is grossly unfair. And what we're seeing here from this government in alliance with the Greens, we can see the Greens trying to push them into even more taxes, and the Labor government will pretend they're resisting, but they'll go along with it in the end. They'll go along with it in the end because they've never seen a tax they don't like. And farmers are worried about this. And I've spoken to the farmers. And, and I've, I've said to farmers, I've said, how many people, how many of your, 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 your fellow farmers, uh, you're in this position, but how many of your fellow farmers would have property in, in self-managed superannuation? And they, the, the words that were said back to me was, well, definitely the majority. Definitely the majority. This is not an uh, unusual practice. This is not a big end of town practice. This is not something that only you know, highly wealthy farming uh, families are doing. This is a legitimate way of planning for their retirements in a way that was, was completely legal, completely allowed, and they plan for their retirements by putting this property, uh, whether it's farming property, whether it's, it's residential uh, uh, or, or real estate, whether it's, it's, it's a business premises, whether it's professional offices, into their super funds to plan for their retirements. They don't necessarily have a lot of cash, and that's the reality of a lot of small business owners. That's the reality of a lot of small business owners. They're not cash rich. They may have assets. They may have assets that, in your view, those opposites' view puts them in the big end of town, but they're cash poor. And if you are taxing an unrealised asset, then the only way to find the cash to pay that tax is either to take it out of your own pocket or to sell the asset. And that is a disgrace. Thank you. Senator Payman. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I'm really glad to be here again to be able to respond to the ridiculous claims being made by the opposition. I'm happy to explain in detail exactly the modest proposal we have made, because apparently some of you still don't get it. But first, I want to ask, what was, where was this passion and concern when you were in government? You have left us with a trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it. So why now the hysteria as we propose these modest changes Order. to repair the budget? Order. The hypocrisy from those on the other side is astounding and Australians can see right through it. Our Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, has always been honest and open with Australians and we're happy to continue having this conversation. We're making modest adjustments to superannuation tax breaks for earnings on balances above $3 million. This change won't come into effect until after the next election. 99.5 per cent of Australians with super accounts 
will keep receiving the same generous tax breaks, and the 0.5 per cent of people with balances above $3 million will still receive tax breaks, just slightly less generous. There continues to be no limit on the amount of money people can put into their super in the accumulation phase, and it applies to future earnings. It's not retrospective. Since coming to government, we've been upfront about the challenges facing the economy and the budget. We inherited a trillion dollars in debt, as well as growing spending pressures in defence, health, aged care and the NDIS. This is about responsible economic management, something I think those on the other side have yet to wrap their heads around. Right now, Australians are making hard choices around the kitchen table about their priorities, and it's important that the government does the same thing around the cabinet table. Today, on International Women's Day, I also want to acknowledge that gender inequality exists within super. Women retire with less than men, and the average super balance of a woman is in the order of $140,000. The Labor Party is serious about doing more to address inequality while also repairing the budget. Part of addressing that is dealing with wage rises for feminised industries in which women are typically underpaid, such as aged care, which we have delivered already. Now, our, our highest priority is targeted cost of living relief in the budget while the Liberals' highest priority is bigger tax breaks for people who already have tens of millions of dollars in super. I think it's about time the opposition had a look in the mirror and got serious about helping Australians who need it. You could have chosen to rise to the moment and get serious about working for all Australians, but instead you've jumped straight into stoking fear and division. The Liberals know, as well as we do, that they've left us with a trillion dollars of debt. And so it really astounds me that they now want us to bo borrow more money to subsidise people with millions of dollars already in their superannuation accounts. Is this really the hill you want to die on? Is this really more important than energy bill relief for pensioners, than more affordable housing for women fleeing domestic violence, than supporting manufacturing jobs? What about the cheaper childcare uh, for families? I certainly don't see it that way. And after hearing the contributions from senators opposite, I'm even more thankful that the adults Order. are back in Order. charge. We have to address the challenges in the budget. There's no getting around that. No beating around the bush and no uh, burying our heads in the sand. Order. And we could, we could make tax concessions for people with millions of dollars more sustainable, making the system fairer or for everyone, or we could go after the most vulnerable like the Liberals did with robo-debt and attacking Medicare. Well, Order. Acting Deputy President, I'm proud of our choices and I'm proud that our Treasurer and Prime Minister have been upfront with the Australian people. Don't forget that it was the Australian people who voted us to clean your mess. The decade of delay, denial and destruction that you left them in. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payman. Senator Davey. Thank you, and thank you so much, Senator Payman, for opening the way for me to remind people what they voted for. They voted for a government who said that they would cut electricity bills by $275. Broken promise. That people would have cheaper mortgages. Broken promise. That there would be no changes to superannuation broken promise, there would be lower inflation, broken promise, that they would not touch franking credits, broken promise, that there would not be industry-wide bargaining, it's not part of our policy, they said, broken promise. We will be do our, doing our bit to assist real wage rises, broken promise. I can go on and on and on about broken promises. In fact, the only promise they won't break is the promise to go out and buy water from innocent farmers. But 
I digress on the real issue today. The real issue today is that while Senator Payman is talking about people with tens of millions of dollars in super, and over in the other place the Assistant Treasurer is talking about people with hundreds of millions of dollars in super, the reality is what Labor want to do is tax people people at a threshold of just three million. Why won't you talk about the three million, Senator Payman? Why won't the Assistant Treasurer in the other place talk about the three million? Because as we learnt this week, it's not 0.5 per cent of the population that these super taxes will hit. It's a minimum of 10 per cent of the population. Someone who is 37 today, in 30 years' time when they're re ready to retire, will be hit by these taxes. And now we are learning that, uh, when asked in question time today, the Assistant Treasurer basically admitted. He said that, yes, farmers or family businesses who have their assets in self-managed future should have just put more money aside for li liquidity fluctuations. He said super is about providing a retirement income stream, but in the same breath said that the very people who've put assets in their super for their retirement income stream should have put more cash aside to pay their taxes. The Assistant Treasurer basically said farmers holding farmland or family businesses holding their assets in self-managed super funds could be forced to pay tens of thousands more in taxes under Labor's superannuation changes due to nothing more than fluctuations in volatile commercial property prices. Now, we are not talking about the few people with mainstream super that have balances over three million. We are talking about the very same hardworking people who have planned for their retirement. As the Assistant Treasurer said today, superannuation is about providing adequate retirement savings. And that's exactly what these people we're talking about have been doing. And now they're being told, oh, if your paper valuation of your assets goes up, you need enough liquid cash to be able to pay your tax. The National Farmers Federation have warned that these superannuation changes could call investment in agriculture. Now, I, for one, have been talking ad infinitum about the need for Australians to invest in Australian agriculture. We need Australian super firms to invest in Australian agriculture. Indeed, overseas super firms think Australian agriculture is a great investment. Look at the Canadian superannuation funds. They invest over here. They won't be hit by these taxes, but we will call our own investment in Australian agriculture through these changes. For many farmers, their farm is their superannuation, and it's not uncommon, uncommon to hold land assets in superannuation. But in what we've learnt today, where they say that Labor will tax unrealised paper gains. So if that's a yes for property, it's also a yes for shares. And if it's a yes for shares, it must also then apply to direct, uh, defined benefit funds. And it must also apply to the hundreds of Commonwealth public servants who have high superannuation pension funds that will also be quaking in fear by what we are learning drip by drip, just like water torture, every time we hear more about this Labor super tax. Uh, thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, the time uh, for this discussion has expired. Uh, and I understand that we uh, need to uh, vote on um, Senator McKim's urgency uh, motion um, uh, and that that needs to occur for reasons that precede my presence in the chair. Uh, so I will now um, put the question uh, that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Uh, a division is required. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim for the ayes and Senator Cadell for the noes. <laughs> the result of the division is ayes 11, noes 24. The question is resolved in the negative. <laughs>